The CLS filter and its variants is probably one of the most commonly utilized restoration filter. It simply turns an unconstrained least squares optimization problem into a constrained one. It restricts the solution space of the least squares approach by incorporating into the problem prior knowledge about the solution. A meaningful solution, therefore, results this way. The mechanics of finding the solution to the constrained problem are not a challenge. They represent some standard optimization steps. The real challenge is how to best represent this prior knowledge and the determination of the significance or the weight of this prior knowledge towards the final solution. This weight is typically referred to as a Lagrange multiplier or a regularization parameter and controls the relative importance of the fidelity to the data term and the prior knowledge term towards the final solution. We will explain all these aspects in detail in this segment. A way to improve upon the solution we obtained through the least squares filter or the inverse filter that we just described is to impose a constraint on the solution. So as before, we minimize this error term with respect to f, but subject to the constraint shown here. C is an operator that needs to be chosen. It's by and large a high pass filter or operator. In which case, this constraint tells us that the energy, as imposed by the norm, of the restored image at high frequencies is below a threshold here, which means that we don't allow arbitrary high frequency fluctuations in the solution, or put it differently, this imposes a smoothness requirement on the solution. So I have this term that preserves the fidelity to the data, and this term that expresses prior knowledge. A standard way to solve a constrained problem is to relax it and turn it, turn it into an unconstrained problem through the introduction of a parameter, alpha here, which is referred to as either a regularization parameter or Lagrange multiplier. Regularization is the process according to which we try to have the solution depend continuously on the data or not allowing the noise amplification that we saw in the previous examples. So now we have to minimize the functional inside the parentheses. We take the gradient of it with respect to f, we set it equal to 0, something that you can do now since you've done it for the least squares, plus I gave you all the formulas that you need to carry out this uh, gradient operation. And if we do so, we'll see that the solution is given by this expression. So f is the restored image. Here is a matrix that, again, I find it's generalized inverse. If it's invertible, that's a regular inverse, times this vector here. Another way to interpret this introduction of the constraint is by looking at this matrix. If H transpose H is not invertible, then the addition of this term might make the matrix invertible. Or by and large, the condition number of H transpose H is large, that's an expression of this ill-posedness as it's referred to, and the addition again of this term makes the condition number smaller, and therefore the problem behaves better. One choice for C is to be a high-pass filter such as the 2D Laplacian, and this is the impulse response of the 2D Laplacian. We did mention it when we talked about enhancement, and we're going to study it a bit more actually carefully when we talk about segmentation. So if both C and H are block circulant, then I can take this expression to the discrete frequency domain, and this is the expression of the constraint least squares filter under this case again of H and C block circulant, and therefore I can bring everything to the discrete frequency domain. Clearly, if alpha equals 0, then 
CLS, constraint list squares, becomes list squares or inverse filter. By and large, the solution F is a function of alpha, clearly, right, as can be seen from here. And alpha should be chosen in such a way that C of F of A, the norm of this square, should be less than epsilon. So assuming that we know epsilon, we have to adjust alpha appropriately so the constraint is satisfied. So let us see now how this filter performs and how it compares with the least squares filter. So again, for the example we've been considering, this is the magnitude of the frequency response of the degradation system, is just uh, the frequency response of this one dimensional motion blur. We've seen this before. Uh, this is U, this is V. And this is the frequency response of the constraint filter. So this is the magnitude of the 2D Laplacian. It's a high pass filter. The zero is here at the center. It's the actually it's zero at zero if you look at the impulse response, and it just grows to high frequencies. So if you look at uh, you know the various frequencies like pi pi or minus pi pi, it achieves its largest value, which is equal to four. Okay, so this is the filter we'll use to carry out the constraint least squares filtering. So we see here the denominator of the constraint least squares filter. This is the value of alpha, 0.1. So I add the magnitude of the low pass degradation filter to the magnitude of the high pass regularization filter. So this is the shape here, and the main characteristic is now I don't have small values anymore, very small values. Actually, I don't have the exact zeros that I had before in, right, that this, this function has. And at high frequencies, you see that the values increase, right? So when I'm going to invert this now according to the least squares filter, I, I'm not going to have one over very small values that will just amplify noise and, and things of that nature. So actually, this is the magnitude of the least squares filter for this particular choice of alpha and of course for this particular c we are talking about here so uh, again the zero zero is in the center so this is one over the sink with alpha equals zero and we see that the restoration filter is tapered off at high frequencies right it doesn't get amplified at high frequencies um, so it has some kind of large values at mid frequencies and then drops off as you go to, to high frequencies. So this does not allow, the, again, the, the noise amplification that we've seen before. As in the previous slide, we show here the denominator of the constraint least squares filter for a different alpha. Alpha is 0 0.01, an order of magnitude smaller than in the previous case. So because of that, the shape of HUV has not been altered that much. However, uh, I don't have the exact zeros that I had before, so uh, the addition of C has made the denominator of the constraint least squares filter better behaving. So now the magnitude of the constraint least squares filter looks like this. Again, the main characteristic is that uh, the high frequencies are tapered off. They don't go up to high values, and these are responsible for noise amplification. We show here three different restorations by the constraint least squares filter for three different values of alpha, the regularization parameter. So the general observation is that, as we explained already, as alpha becomes smaller and smaller, we move this direction we move closer to the inverse filter, and therefore we see more noise present in the restored image, more noise amplification. Or going this way, the, as alpha increases, the solution is a smoother solution, because we have those two terms, fidelity to the data and smoothness of the solution, so a higher alpha gives more weight to the smoothness of the solution. When I minimize it, therefore, I have to make the norm of CF much smaller now as alpha increases and therefore this results to a smoother solution. 
So I have this knob, I have this parameter alpha that now I can adjust and control the smoothness of the solution versus the noise amplification. And if epsilon again is given in the constraint, if epsilon is given, then I have to adjust alpha so that this constraint is satisfied. If epsilon is not given to us, then we just uh, either pick alpha by trial and error, similar to what we show here, or utilize a number of techniques that exist, such as cross-validation techniques that will let us uh, choose the appropriate alpha. Let us now have a closer look at the effect of the regularization parameter, which we called alpha, on the quality of the restored image based on this constrained squares filter. So it has been shown in this work shown here that the error between the restored image, which is a function of the regularization parameter, and the original image is given by this expression. Don't worry about this expectation value. It, it, this is an expression that holds true on the average. So there are two terms, a bias term, which is a function of the restored image, and a variance term, which is also a function of the restored image. Actually, the exact expressions for the variance and bias are shown here. All the quantities in these expressions have been defined previously. Sigma of n squared is the variance of the noise, and the image dimensions are m by n. If I plot these two quantities, the variance and the bias, for a specific image, actually Lina was used, the degradation was due to a 7 by 7 flat impulse response, the 2D Laplacian was used for C, and the blurred signal-to-noise ratio was 20 dB. We see this plot here. So on the vertical axis, this error is shown while on the horizontal axis, the values of alpha um, are shown. There's actually a very wide range of the values of alpha going from 10 to the minus 14 to 10 to the fourth. So there are 18 orders of magnitude, and actually the vertical scale goes from 10 to the minus 6 to then 10 to the 12th. So the main observation here is that the bias term, this term here, increases as a function of alpha. So the larger the alpha, the larger the bias in the solution, while the variance term decreases as a function of alpha. We show here in solid line the sum of these two terms because this expresses the error. Our objective clearly is to minimize this error between the restoration and the original image. Therefore, we're interested in finding the, the minimum of this solid curve, a point around here. So then the corresponding alpha should be the optimum, one might say alpha with respect to the mean squared error that one would like to use. This function here could be rather flat for a, a range of values. So it may not be a single point, but a range of values of alpha, let's say this one, for which the function of the error is pretty flat, achieves the, the, the smallest values. So this then shows that the solution is robust with respect to alpha, uh, since there might be a couple of order of magnitudes of values of alpha that will give uh, the smallest possible error. So let's see how these terms, the variance and the bias, manifest themselves with a specific example. So let's look at the effect of the regularization parameter on the CLS solution with the use of an example. So we're using the same example throughout this lecture. So the blurred image is due to motion over 8 pixels. Blurred signal-to-noise ratio is 20 dB. And here is the restored image for alpha equals 0 0.01. And here is the error, the absolute value of the error between the original and the restored. And since this is small by and large, it's mapped linearly into this range, 32 to 255, for visualization purposes. This is the smallest alpha we'll use. So the image is 
rather noisy. And then if we look at the error, it gives the appearance of noise. So if you recall from the previous drawing we had there, that figure at the small, let's say, value of alpha, the variance is rather large and the bias is, is small. And as alpha increases, the bias increases and the variance drops. So looking again at this error here, we can say that uh, it looks again like noise. It has a large variance. It doesn't reveal much about the structure of the image, maybe a little bit. So if we increase alpha now and look at the restoration, we see, as we know by now, a smoother image. The noise is reduced. But looking at the error, the variance of this error image is reduced, but the bias has increased. And by bias, it means that now the error has, has some structure. It tells you something about the original image. And actually, what it tells you is that the error is dominant at the edges of the image, at the regions of high frequency. Because what happens as alpha increases, you give more preference, more weight to the smoothness. You prefer a smooth solution, which means you filter out some of the high frequencies of the image as well. The image becomes smoother, and therefore the error shows here, its largest shows the, the edge configuration of the image. If we consider even a higher alpha equals 1, then the restoration is even smoother. And this is the error term. Uh, no noise in it, you might say, but the edges are pronounced, the, the bias of this image is, is the greatest out, out of all the restorations we had. The choice of the regularization parameter alpha is of the utmost importance since, as we saw, determines the trade-off between noise amplification and smoothness of the solution. We briefly discussed here some of the methods to determine it. So if the noise variance is known, then this problem is solved. We minimize the stabilizing functional subject to the constraint that this discrepancy is equal to epsilon square, the noise variance. Then we choose alpha so that y minus hf, which is a function of alpha squared, is approximately equal to epsilon squared. So one can derive here um, iterative ways to adjust alpha so that this is satisfied. Now, if the noise variance is not known, one can use visual inspection. That is the human in the loop approach. The human op operator, assuming that he or she has some knowledge about the structure of the image, say it's an image of a natural scene, can choose alpha so as to produce the most desirable or useful solution. Now, if an iterative algorithm is used to implement the CLS filter, then as we saw, the number of iterations can be used as a means of regularization. So a second method, if the noise variance is not known, is the L curve. If we plot here in a log-log scale the fidelity to the data term and the log of the stabilizing term, then as a function of alpha, this curve is going to have a shape like this. So here, alpha is too small, and therefore it's an under-regularized solution, while at this end, so as alpha changes, I traverse this curve here, alpha is too large, which means that we over-regularize the solution. So this point here, this looks like an L curve, and this point, therefore, is a transition between an under-regularized and an over-regularized solution, and therefore it seems like a reasonable choice for, for alpha. So this is the alpha star that we are after.
and the third approach I would like to mention here when again the noise variance is not known so for all these approaches noise variance unknown is the generalized cross-validation approach the general idea behind it is to minimize the set of prediction errors that is to choose alpha so that the regularized solution obtained with the data point removed predicts this missing point well when averaged over all ways of removing a point specific expressions result and there is quite some detail in this reference here about it so here is a representative list of ways of choosing the regularization parameter and when we cover Bayesian techniques will see that they provide the means to estimate the regularization parameter as well. We want to briefly discuss here extensions or generalizations of the constraint least squares filter we discussed so far. We show the expression for the filter here. We minimize the sum of these quadratic terms, the fidelity to the data term and the stabilizing functional. So both of these are L2 norms or quadratic terms. And as we saw in this case, we can obtain a closed form expression for the solution that minimizes this sum of quadratics. In general, a restoration can be obtained by minimizing this functional here, where J1 represents a distance measure between the data and the restored image after it's being processed by the system and J2 is the general stabilizing term. So in general, both J1 and J2 may be non-quadratic functions of F. In this case, no closed form expression for the solution can be found, as was the case with uh, CLS. And in this case, one has to resort to iterative optimization solutions. The successive approximations iteration we just covered might present one possible choice, but of course there are a number of methods available from optimization theory. We will not discuss any of them here since this is outside the scope of this course. So here are some examples and rather popular choices of these J1, J2 functionals. So the first one is the maximum entropy regularization term. So this is the expression for the negative of the entropy and instead of maximizing the entropy we minimize the negative of the entropy we'll talk about the entropy concept when we cover compression but in general is a measure of the uncertainty or the randomness in the image therefore an image with maximum entropy is a smooth image the entropy is a non-quadratic term and therefore a non-linear optimization problem results that needs to be solved iteratively. This is a regularization term or an approach, the maximum entropy approach that has been uh, utilized quite widely. The TTV or total variation regularization is another popular approach. Delta of F here is the gradient of the image and I is its ith component or the gradient at the ith pixel so we assume there are n pixels in the image as was previously the case and therefore the total variation of a signal is the total amount of change the signal goes through and is therefore a measure of the signal variability we want to control such variability and therefore a smoothness requirement is imposed on the solution by minimizing the total variation the resulting problem is also nonlinear and therefore iterative optimization methods need to be deployed. A main idea of the non-quadratic functionals is to be such that they do not penalize large values of their argument as much as the quadratic, the L2 penalty does. A regularizer with such properties is the LP norm that's shown here. So P is between 1 and 2 and we take the ith element of the vector z we raise it to the p power and we sum over all the entries of the vector or all the pixels of the image 
So if p is chosen between 1 and 2 as shown here, these functions are still convex functions of their arguments, and therefore the optimization is rather straightforward, relatively speaking. This LP norm can be used both for the J1 and the J2 functionals here. We're going to revisit actually these norms when we talk about sparsity in the last week of classes since these norms promote sparse solutions.